All right, if you've got your marker in 1 John 5, turn to Genesis chapter number 1. There's something unusual about this lesson for me, and that's I want to do a lot of talking before we get started on the lesson. And usually I like to jump right in, let the Word interpret the Word, and do what the Lord's given. But I, I've been chewing on this subject for a while. Look at Genesis chapter number 1 and verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That seems to me to be a general statement telling us God did the creating. There's no let there be's in that verse. There's let there be's come later. And our pastor has pointed out that there was a let there be light before there were any sources of natural light. And it was a manifestation of Christ. It makes you think about Christ Jesus being brought forth. Not being created, but being shown, being manifested. Well, I finally noticed something. Look at verse number two. And the earth was without form and void. It wasn't created yet. The, verse, the first verse says God created the heaven and the earth, but it's not created yet. The earth is not in existence. It's without form and it's void. And darkness was upon the face of what? The of the deep. Until I studied this lesson, I've always thought the deep was a big nothing, everything outside of God. There was nothing here but God. But there's a sentence that follows the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I finally noticed something. Where is, let there be water? I thought, now, was water already here? I even wrestled with a little while, is water eternal? But you know what deep is? According to Strong's Concordance and its word 8415, it does mean an abyss, and then he's got parentheses, as a surging mass of water, especially the deep, uh, no, wait a minute, yeah, especially the deep, the main sea or the subterranean water supply, and it's translated deep place and depth. So I got to thinking, okay, if there was light before there were natural sources of light and it manifests Christ, this appearance of water here where we're not told let there be water, it must have something to do with Christ Jesus. The Lord straightened me out on something last week during Brother Gene's second message when he read out of Proverbs chapter 8, the personification of wisdom. And let's turn to that because I want to I I show it. Perso uh, Proverbs chapter 8. The personification of wisdom, and it can be applied to Christ, who is our wisdom. But there is a statement here. Proverbs 8, chapter number 1, just so we, I mean, verse number 1, so we'll know that it's wisdom talking. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? And uh, verse 12, I wisdom dwell with prudence, so on and so forth. But look at verses uh, 22 beginning with verse number 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was, when there were no what? Yeah. I was brought forth when there was no what? Yeah. Abounding with what? Water. Before the mountains were, and so forth. So I do know that physical water was created. It was not here eternally. But the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. So I got to thinking, all right, Lord, but does the waters, does water have anything to do with Christ Jesus? Is there a study there? Is there something I'm not seeing? Now turn to our text verse, verse John 5. First John chapter number 5. Verses 5 through 9. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. 
Now notice where we're going, verse number 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Bear record of what? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He has come. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. All right, here's the Trinity. The Father, the Word, who is the Son. The Word was made flesh, correct? And the Holy Ghost. Have you ever noticed, and I, someone might can prove me wrong on this, but anytime anyone discusses the Trinity, it's in that order. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Even charismatics who worship, I mean, who emphasize the Spirit, they never say, well, you know, the Trinity is the Spirit and the Father and the Son. People always say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the order. Jesus himself used that. Keep your finger here. Go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Verse number 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So I think the order is important. I believe the order is inspired of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's the way you hear the Trinity always discussed. Okay, go back to 1 John chapter 5. There are also witnesses in the earth that say Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Read verse number, and let's, go, let's read verse number 8. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. The Spirit, notice a little less, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And guess what? These three are one. There's an earthly trinity that bears witness to Christ, and it's the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Okay, now here's where a personal conviction comes into place. If you disagree with me, bear with me through the end of the lesson and still see if there's principles in this lesson that will help you. But I'm thinking, if the order is important in the first, Father, Word, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then you have Spirit, Water, and Blood, the order must be important in the second. And it must correspond, I'm thinking it's got to correspond to the Trinity. So the Father has something to do with Spirit. The Word, the Son of God, is linked to water and the Holy Ghost to blood. Now before I studied this lesson, if you and I had been sitting around the dinner table and you brought up this verse, I would have naturally in my mind would have put blood with the Son because He shed His blood. He had blood. But people, who applies the blood? The Spirit of God applies the blood to you, right? Who gave the Son of God His blood? His Father. And how did that happen? The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary. And that holy thing formed in her womb. But here it says, the Word takes the middle place. So I thought, okay, there is a link between Christ and water. Then here was my dilemma. There's two ways of looking at this. You can go throughout the scripture, find references to water, ask the Lord to show you what the spiritual significance is. I believe that would be a very good lesson. That's not what I did, though. These three witnesses are on the earth, right? These are earthly witnesses. The spirit, the water, and the blood. So I thought, I'm, what I, I want to do is I want to look at Christ Jesus during his earthly ministry while he was here and see the times he encountered or used and maybe even spoke. I haven't done the spoke part yet in my study, but of water. Water is a witness of Christ. Isn't it interesting the Lord gave me this lesson on a day when it's raining? Water is falling from the sky. The rain falls on who? Just and the unjust. Christ is Savior and God and Creator of who all? The just and the unjust. Maybe I didn't express that just right, but you know, he's sovereign over all. So what I want to do is I want to look at Christ and water during his earthly ministry and see if there's anything we can draw from it. And not to be interesting to draw symbols out of the Bible, what can it do for us in 2015? What can it do for us in 2015? So look at uh, Matthew chapter number 3. 
I think the first chronological mention was his baptism. Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, notice this next phrase, went up straightway where or from? Out of the water. Out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. People who, be who uh, believe in total immersion can use this verse and prove it. I think there's more to it than that. Jesus wasn't anointed on the top of his head. He wasn't sprinkled. He was immersed in water. But he came up straightway out of the water. What do I see in this? I think this speaks of his humanity. Water in the scripture is often used to mean masses of people. Often wicked people. Now we know he's not wicked. But Christ came. He, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Do you see where I'm going? He's human. He's fully human. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2. Verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through their fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore it, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. Christ was and is a man. He was and is Almighty God, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Folks, we don't need to be so afraid of Him or so in awe of Him that we can't approach to Him. Let me tell you something about that Christ Jesus knows. He knows everything that you've gone through. He's been there and he's done it. And how many points was he tempted? Oh. Yet without sin. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, he lived back then and I live in 20 whatever. Listen, read the Bible. He hungered. He grew weary. He went to a wedding. He went to a cemetery. He had to deal with enemies. He was misunderstood. <laughs> He had to deal positively and negatively with natural kin. Guess what? His body was injured. And he died. He's been everywhere you've been. We don't ever need to forget that. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. He came up out of the water. He's different than every other man. But his mother was human. He has a human body. It speaks of his humanity. He straight up came up out of the water. He is one of us. He's one of us. Philippians 2, chapter number, uh, verse number 7. Philippians 2, number, uh, Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 7. But made of himself, and we're speaking of Christ Jesus in verse 5, verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and it took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. 
Don't ever let the devil or some false concept of rever uh, not reverence, some co false concept of unapproachability to God ever take away from you the blessing of the humanity of your Savior, of Christ Jesus. He came up out of the water. He was one of us. I like what the pastor has said in times past. People say, well, you know, if I lived back then, I'd be a better Christian. It'd be easier to believe. He said, if you believed back then, your neighbor was the son of God. If you'd lived back then. But you know what? He is one of us. He's totally human. All right. What was his first miracle? It happened at a wedding in Cana, right? What did he do? Y'all tell me. Okay. He turned what into wine? He turned water into what? Wine. That was his first miracle. And you know what he did? He showed the world what he was all about. It's a picture of salvation. If water, and let's read that. Let's, before we go any further, read that. I wanted to read this earlier. Look at Isaiah 57, 20. Isaiah 57, 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my Lord, to the wicked. Well, Brother Gary, you're, you're, taking, you're kind of stretching things. That says to the wicked. Well, let me ask you a question. What was every redeemed soul before he was redeemed? Wicked was a sinner. Mass of humanity is like troubled water. But Jesus comes and he changes that. This miracle at the wedding of Cana, what did he do? He took a substance and changed its nature and made it into something better, different. And I'm going to say it in, and say it, finer. Let's look at that. John chapter number 2. Let's, let's read the account. John 2. Verse, we're going to read first verses 1 through 3. We're not going to read the whole thing. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Now look at verses 7 through 9. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set out forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then, they, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. When the Holy Ghost fell in the book of Acts, what did they call, accuse him of? They're being full of new wine. New wine. It's the salvation of sinners and believers when Christ turns water into wine. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Christ and the witness of water. He turned water into wine. He came up out of the water in his baptism. 2 Corinthians 5. Verses 17 and 18. These are familiar scriptures. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It takes salvation. Listen, I'm going to make an obvious statement. A believer, a possessor of Christ, is not like everybody else. You have to be very careful with that. We don't want to be pharisaical. We don't want it to turn into any kind of self-righteousness or religious snobbery. But a believer is not like everybody else. He's wine who used to be water. And Christ Jesus has made the difference. Too often we emphasize 
our flesh. We don't want to be snobs. We don't want to be Pharisees. So we emphasize, and guess what? Christ Jesus told us the flesh is still being flesh. But we need to behave as and remember we are children of God. Our natures have been changed. We need to behave like that. And we need to remember we are not of the world. And we are no longer like everybody else. Everybody else being those who are outside of Christ Jesus, who've never been redeemed. They are water who have not been turned into wine. The Lord told the, uh, the, uh, the Hebrew children in Egypt, the Lord has made a difference between you and Egypt. And folks, you know, the world recognizes that. The world recognizes that. They won't embrace your Savior or whatever, but they'll come to you for answers about what's right and wrong. They'll know you're different. There was a, a guy at work for years. He led a terrible lifestyle, no profession of faith, terrible living, he was, and he was a shop steward. Didn't mind taking on management at any given time. Right out of grievance. Anytime there was a conflict and he couldn't prove his point and he knew I had witnessed it or I'd been part of the situation, you know what he would tell them when, when they were fussing in the office? Go get Baldy. He's a Christian. He recognized that. We were friends. I gave him tracks, but the world recognizes that. They'll even make fun of you how you live and, and, and the things you believe, but you let little Johnny get sick and they're going to come and ask you to pray for him. The world recognizes it. Let me tell you something. The church needs to recognize it in the proper form. Not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Not like self-righteous people. But we, we need to remember, Jesus has turned us into wine. And think about the scriptures about wine in the Bible. Take a little wine for thine often infirmities. Like I said, people come to you for answers. Guess what? Christians have most of the answers. Because the answer is our Lord. But we know what the Word says about most things about right and wrong. We, you know, we don't always have every exact answer, but you know what I'm saying. The world out there doesn't believe in anything. We have something we believe in, and we, we're, we have an answer. It says, the, heart, the wine doeth the heart of man, makes the heart of man glad. Christians should be the happiest people on the earth. They should have a lot better attitude than worldlings have. You know, they're so sick and tired of the world and politics and crime and violence and, and money not going anywhere and all that kind of stuff. But Christians are wine. They're water turned into wine. By whom? Christ Jesus. It was his first miracle. His first miracle. He turned the water into wine. How are we going on time? All right, we've got one more point. I hope Brother Jamie will give me another Sunday. He came up out of the water in baptism, and he turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana. Christ Jesus also walked on water, didn't he? He walked on water. Let's read that, Matthew 14. And folks, some of these thoughts I'm having, they're not all inclusive. I hope you're going to think on it. You know what my goal is, or my desire for this lesson is? Every time you encounter water, you'll think about Christ Jesus and you'll glorify God in it some way. I want you to think about water. It refreshes. It cleanses. All the things about water. You can cook with it, whatever. And you should, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I want, I want you to never think about water the same again. It's a witness of Christ Jesus. Matthew 14, verses 25 and 26. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Let's read the next verse. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And we know the story, particularly in this account. Peter gets out, he sees the... The waves, he begins to sink, and Jesus saves him, and they get in the boat. There is one account of this where it says Jesus was walking, and, and the phrase is, and he would have passed them by. 
I've always kind of struggled with that a little bit because I thought he got in the boat with them. That had to be his intent. I think it means he was walking at an angle that he would have been right there at him. He was coming to get into the boat. But he would have passed him by. He would have been right there. He was coming. But what can we, what can we see from this? Nothing can keep him from you. Not in salvation, not in your relationship, and not in any trouble. It was a stormy sea, and he was walking on it. He was walking on that water, and where was he going? He was going to his disciples. And what did he do? He got in the boat with them. Nothing can keep him from you. And I think about the wicked being like the troubled sea. Do you know when the Lord saved me, there were people around me who didn't get saved? The Lord didn't save them. Maybe he walked on them to get to me. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, I will give men for you. I will give men for you. I hope some of the people who were around me when, I was, when the Lord saved me were saved later in life. I don't know. But he walked on the sea to get to me. And I think about him being a name above every name. If you're walking on the sea, you're above it. He is coming in contact with it. He's walking on it, but he's above it. This is him being having no sin, knew no sin, and was without sin. He was a man, but he was walking on the sea. So there's a, a witness of water. He walked on water. He turned water into wine. He came up out of the water in baptism. And I'm going to give you stuff to think about before next week. He encountered, the, he encountered the tears of a woman. He also shed his own tears. He poured water into a basin. We've, uh, that's, that's been preached on here just lately when he washed the disciples' feet. And thirdly, from his dead body issued blood and water. And there's stuff for us to draw from that. Anybody have any questions or comments? When you see Brother Gene take a drink of water, think about something. Think about Christ Jesus filling him and speaking to us. That's going to be the lesson on filling the basin. Here I go, I'm going to teach it if I don't be quiet. Please stand with me and we'll be dismissed. As always, I want to thank you for your attention and your attendance.